Today we're beginning another uh, sermon series uh, in the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is 21 chapters in all, and so this will be a pretty lengthy sermon series. I don't plan on hitting every single verse in the Gospel of John because uh, that would take us probably around two and a half years to do so. But we will be going uh, in order uh, through uh, all 21 chapters through uh, something like 30 weeks of sermons. And so uh, make sure you don't miss any of them, <laughs> uh, that you're here to uh, hear God's, God's word. Today we're in uh, the first chapter of John, and this is called uh, the prologue. Okay, I'll get into that a little bit more. The Gospel of John is about Jesus. Jesus, who is the Son of God, sent into this world through the love of the Father to become the Jesus of history, the man that was actually born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, the man that was actually born of the virgin birth, the man who actually lived and walked on this earth In human flesh, the man that actually died a real death on the cross as a criminal, rejected by his own creation and also rejected by his father, God. The Gospel of John is about Jesus Christ, the Jesus of history, the actual Jesus of history, how he was sent into this world so that the glory and the grace of God may, might be, uniquely and also perfectly revealed, disclosed, and shared with sinners like you and me, sinners saved by grace through faith alone. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. I'm just kidding. The Gospel of John was written by none other than John. But who is John? This John is the John that we read in the Gospels, the son of Zebedee, one of the 12 disciples of Jesus, one of the 12 inner circle disciples, the apostles of Jesus. He is also the self-proclaimed disciple whom Jesus loved. This is how he refers to himself within his Gospel. He is also nicknamed the evangelist, and rightly so, because evangelism Right? Preaching the gospel to others so that they may believe is the nature, is really the core of the, the, of the gospel of John. John, he wrote this gospel so that many people may read and believe in Jesus Christ. Many people, just like you and me. And notice I said, not hear and believe, but read and believe meaning you should read this book. And this brings us to the title of this sermon series. The the title of today's sermon is The Word of God, but the sermon series is titled Follow Me and Believe. Follow Me and Believe. This is the sermon title that I've got after hours of reading and reading and reading again this gospel. I think I read this gospel over again, uh, I don't know, five to seven times, at least for just this sermon series. Follow me and believe. These are really, truly the words of Jesus Christ found within this gospel of John. It is very clearly written by John that this is the purpose with which he is writing this word. If you turn with me, the evangelist writes very clearly in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. He says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the gospel of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that, this is the important part, the purpose is here, so that you may believe. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Amen? Come on, y'all. Amen? Praise be to God. So, as we go deeper and deeper into the Gospel of John, my prayer and hope is that you, yes, 
you, all of you, that you would fall deeper and deeper into the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you would not only know in your head about Jesus Christ, that not only that you would know more about this specific gospel of John, but my hope and prayer is that you would actually take the steps of following Jesus and believing in his gospel. This gospel is the good news that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16. Amen? Praise be to God. Brothers and sisters, I am actually very excited to be preaching in the Gospel of John. God has a great plan for us this year in this ministry. Amen? May God's plan be evident to us as we go throughout this book. Four years ago, February 2019, is when God called me to be a pastor here at the Korean Church of Queens. It's been almost exactly four years. February 1st, 2019 was when I first started at the Korean Church of Queens. And as we begin, uh, as, as I begin, by God's grace, the fifth year here at KCQ, I really do believe with my whole heart that God has a great plan for us. And I believe that God has given us this sermon series in the book of John, so that we may actually glean from it all the wisdom and the truth that God wants us to live by. So, I urge you, let's get invested in this book. The Gospel of John is a very special, special book. Uh, not only special among the Gospels, but is a very special book altogether. Let's get really involved during the sermons, uh, the 30-some sermons that will come, uh, during the times of discussion in your community groups, whatever it is. I like to say, I think, I don't say it often, but with a book like this, I want us to get down and dirty with this book, get into the nooks and crannies of this book, learn the words, the vocabulary that John specifically chose to use in the book in his book, let's get down and dirty with the Gospel of John. There's so much to be gained here. And so, please pay close attention. I'm going to read for us one more, one, more, one more time. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. These five verses are the beginning of the beginning of John. The beginning of the beginning of the Gospel of John. In technical terms, what we call this is the Johannine Prologue. The prologue of the Gospel of John, right? Johannine, uh, John in. This prologue, the first 18 verses of this chapter uh, we only read five verses of it. Next weekend, I'll be preaching from the last five verses of this prologue. But here, to understand that this is actually the beginning of the beginning, that this is the prologue, right? The, the pre, uh, I guess in some, some books, it's, they call it the preface, right? What we read before we get into the meat of the text to understand that this is the prologue helps us to understand actually major themes within this book and actually uh, structure as we will get into in a bit. Some of the major themes that are included within the prologue that is really expanded upon throughout the book are the theme of life, light. We saw that already in our passage. The theme of witnessing, the theme of trueness or genuineness or the ultimateness, the theme of this world, how we are to live in this world, the theme of glory and truth. These are all major themes that John touches upon within his prologue. 
And then to go one more step, not only is the major themes introduced, are the major themes introduced within the prologue, but we can see a very clear structure within the Gospel of John. The first eight verses make up the prologue, right? The preface. And then the last chapter, chapter 21, makes up what we would call the epilogue, right? The ending, right? Or the uh, appendix of, of uh, the Gospel of John. The first 18 verses are the prologue. The last chapter, the 25 verses, is the epilogue. And in between the prologue and the epilogue, is where we will spend most of our weeks. And this in between, in between the prologue and the epilogue, are two large sections of the gospel. In the first section, the chapters 1, or chapter, yes, chapter 1 to 10, we find Jesus' self-disclosure, his showing, his sharing in word and deed. His teachings, his ministry of who he is, right? His self-disclosure. He's showing us who he is by his words and his deeds, his teachings and his ministry. That's the first section, chapters 1 to 10. And then in the second section, in chapters 13 to 20, we find that Jesus, he discloses himself to us in or on his cross, and through his exaltation afterwards. Christ's passion narrative and the ministry of Christ even after his resurrection. Though That's the main theme of the second section. There's the prologue, the first disclosure of Jesus through his word and deed. The second disclosure of Jesus in his cross and his exaltation. And then the epilogue. That's the really vague structure of the Gospel of John. And so, let's get into some of the details, some of the words, some of the vocabulary that he is using. Verse 1 and 2, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and he was in the beginning with God. I want to start with this phrase, in the beginning. In the beginning, as soon as you hear it, if you are someone who maybe attended Sunday school or you have, you've been reading the Word or reading the Bible for at least a little bit of time, you'll know that these three words, at least in the English, in the beginning, two words in the Greek, these are the first words of the Bible. Not just the Gospel of John, but the Bible. Genesis 1.1, it says, In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. I'm sure you've read that, I I really hope. In the beginning was the word, is how John begins his gospel. Of course, when we read this, or whoever read this in the past, in the early church, whenever this was written, they would have also been reminded, oh, this is similar to the beginning of the whole Bible. Not only Genesis, but it also might point the reader back to the beginning of the Gospel of Mark. Because the Gospel of Mark starts out like this. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. It says, The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Some scholars or some researchers, they see this and say, maybe John is pointing uh, to the work of his colleague, Mark, right? And saying, see, the gospel of Mark really comes or starts at the beginning of Jesus' ministry here on earth. And that's important, right? To know when his ministry began on earth, right? Uh, If you know the gospel of Mark, I think you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But in John, as the reader gets starts the book of John, John is pointing to the fact that this is not just the beginning of the gospel of of Jesus. It's not just the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. Rather, we're going way back. We're going way back to the beginning of the redemptive history of God. We're going way back, far back before creation itself. Adam and Eve? No. Way before. For Adam and Eve. We're all the way back to the beginning of all things. 
before time, in that beginning, was God. And with God was the Word. In the beginning was the Word. You may already know this, but we often call Jesus another name. The Word, the Word of God. In the Greek, this is called logos. Logos. Uh, the Bible software that I use is called logos. It's a, it's a very, very uh, significant Greek word. Logos. This word, logos, in the Greek, literally means word. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the logos. This word, logos, is often debated uh, within the, the scholarly world because it's such a vague word, right? It's such a vague word. The word, back, uh, back in, the, in the time that this was written, the word could have referred to various things. It could have referred to the mind, or it could have referred to the, the norm, the philosophy of the time, of the society. It could have really referred to a bunch of different things. But for us, we want to read the word, the Bible, in context. And the context that I want to give to you today about this word, logos, is the context of the Old Testament, Right? In the beginning was the word. We need to go back into the beginning. Right, We need to go back into the Old Testament and see how was this word, word, logos, how was it used in the Old Testament? Not just in the Greco-Roman world. That's not the most important context. The real important context is the Old Testament. And so the word in the Old Testament, how was it used? Number one, it was used to show God's revelation, God's revealing of himself to his people. That was one of the uses of the word. This is Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying. The word here is used as a way that the Lord has revealed himself to his prophet, Jeremiah. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying. Not only in revealing himself does, he, does God use the word, but there is an uh, aspect of deliverance as well. This is Psalm 107, verse 20. Verse 107, uh, chapter, or Psalm 107, verse 20, it says, He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Not only is the word word used to reveal God, but also it has the power of God's deliverance, of healing, it says. Not only that, but thirdly, there is divine purpose in the word word. Isaiah 55 verse 11, it says, So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. That passage is something I think we should really hold tight as we go into the Gospel of John. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. One of the purposes of the word, lastly, one of the purposes, real big purpose here is that it has a power of creation. Psalm 33, verse 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. There is power of creation in the word. We talked about four different things. Revelation, deliverance, divine purpose, and the power of creation. And this power of creation is mentioned for us in the Gospel of John as well, in the passage that we read today. In verse 3, it says, All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was 
made. This power of creation within the word that was coming out of God's mouth. For us, we can see in, in the first chapter of the Bible, God said the words that came out of his mouth were, let there be light. The words that came out of God's mouth created light. How? Because the word that came out of God's mouth is truth. Amen? If God says there is light, it's not false. It's true. There then is light. Through God's word, the universe was created. Through the logos of God, the universe was created. All things were made through the logos. Without the logos was not anything made that was made. God's word in the Old Testament is his powerful self-expression, revelation in creation, revelation and salvation. The word of God is how God relates with us, how he communicates to us, how he shows himself to us, how he discloses himself to us, how he shares himself, his purpose to us. So it makes perfect sense, right? In this context that John would take the word logos and say, this is the title with which I am talking about Jesus, the Son of God, who is God's ultimate disclosure, the person of his own Son. Does that make sense? God revealed himself to us through his word, the Logos, who is his Son, the one who was with God in the beginning, who is God, came into this world as God revealed himself to us. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. The Logos was with God. This word with in the Greek, it describes a personal relationship. In the Greek, it's called pros, with. This describes a personal relationship in that the father and the son God and the word Logos had a relationship in the beginning. This is the beginning of the doctrine of Trinity. We're not going to get into the doctrine of Trinity today because I think that'll take us till about 12 p.m. But this doctrine of Trinity is evident throughout the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's where we want to be today. The Word was God. I know it's not the easiest listening to the first sermon of this series, right? But I'm going to get even more technical today so that we can have a good foundation on which to build upon this series. Next week, we're going to be in the prologue. Uh, as well, but next week it'll be less technical than today. Usually I don't share information like this, but I think it is very important for us, for us to know the nature of Jesus, nature of Jesus Christ as he walked literally on earth. Who is Jesus? Jesus is fully God and fully man. Amen? Jesus is fully God fully man. In the one person, Jesus, there were two beings, human being and the divine being. It wasn't a mixture. It was two distinct and two full natures, truly God and truly man. This very complicated doctrine was hashed out for us, long, long time ago, at the Council of Chalcedon, okay? You don't even have to write that down. The Council of Chalcedon was in the 5th century, 451 AD. We know even the date of this council, October 8th 
to November 1st, in 451 A.D., the early church fathers came together because there were heresies coming about. There are heresies forming in the Christian world. Long, long time ago, the cults actually formed very long ago, and it was actually dis disrupting the early church. And the, the heresy that had formed was that Jesus was not fully man. Jesus was not fully God. Jesus was a mixture, like a, a demigod or, or some sort. A heresy formed. And so this council uh, came together, Council of Chalcedon. And at this council, there came about a phrase, a phrase that we... Uh, Never refer to, but we should at least hear about, uh, at least in the, in the Gospel of John series. Vera homo, vera deus. Truly man and truly God. This phrase came out of the Council of Chalcedon. And the Council of Chalcedon, uh, it came out with four different negatives that we need to make as our boundary as we understand Jesus, okay? Bear with me. These negatives tell us what Jesus is not, okay? Jesus is not a mixture of two natures. We should be, Jesus is without confusion between two natures, divine and human. I'm just going to leave it there. The the other two uh, negatives is that Jesus is without separation and without division. There is no separation between these two natures of Christ, human and divine, and they are perfectly united within one person, Christ. Without mixture, without confusion, without separation, and without division. That is Jesus Christ, his nature, truly God, truly man. Without mixture, there is no mixing between the two natures. Without confusion, with, there is no confusion between the two natures. There is no separation between two natures. There is no division be between the two natures. Christ is vera homo, vera deus, truly man, truly God. We're good, right? You understood fully. Praise God. Man, you guys are good. This is the Christ that the Gospel of John is talking about. He does go in pretty hard at the very beginning of his gospel. That's the, that's the purpose of the prologue, so that we set a very firm foundation on which we stand as we go into his two sections, the disclosure of this truly man, truly God, Jesus Christ, his disclosure to us in his word and his deed, and in his disclosure to us in the, on the cross and his exaltation. His words, his teachings, we need to understand with this lens on that God, that Jesus is truly man and truly God. We need to understand his deeds, his miracles, his, uh, his ministry. We need to understand this with this uh, lens on that God, Jesus, is truly man, truly God. We need to understand the cross with this lens on, that Jesus is truly man and truly God. When Jesus is exalted, when he returns to heaven, when he ascends to heaven, promising that he will come back to us, we need to understand that with this lens on, that Jesus is truly man and truly God. Verse 4 and 5, it tells us, In him, in Jesus, in the Logos, was life. And the life was the light of man. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. I want us to turn to a passage later in the Gospel of John. In John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus speaks to his disciples and says, I have said these things to you, that in me you, have, you may have peace. 
In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. This evangelical uh, nature of the Gospel of John first tells us who Jesus is. He is truly man and truly God. Truly man that he actually came into this world in the human flesh. He was born a child, a baby, not knowing how to eat, how to walk, how to clothe himself. He walked on this earth, lived a life 30, 30 30-some years, did ministry on earth to die on the cross for us. Not only did he live on this world, on this earth as a man, but he was also God in that he communicated to us things of heaven that no one else knew. He proclaimed himself the the living bread, the truth, the way, and the life, the resurrection. He taught us so many things that men could not teach. The Gospel of John starts out with this, that Jesus is truly man and truly God, but knowing that in our head is not enough. Following Jesus, believing in his gospel, is the purpose of the Gospel of John. Jesus himself says, I have said these things to you so that you may have peace. Why? Because in this world there will be tribulation. There will be tribulation. The world that we live in, as verse 5 tells us, is a world of darkness. And into this darkness, the light of men have come. And as long as we have this light within us, as long as we hold on to this light through our faith, we can live in this world, the world that Christ has overcome. The prologue, this, at least the first, uh, first 18 verses of the Gospel of John, it really focuses on how God disclosed and revealed himself to us in the Logos becoming flesh. That's next week. The Logos, the Word of God became flesh and became an actual human being to walk on this earth, to die on the cross, but to live a sinless life. But not only does it focus on how Jesus came and the nature with which he lived, the divine and the human nature, but it tells us of the result. The result of this amazing, glorious, gracious revelation. The result is this, that all who believe in the Son of God will have eternal life. Not only, but all who believe in the Son of God will be counted as actual children of God, accepted in his presence, accepted in eternal life. Not only so, but those who have faith in Christ, right now as you live on this earth, Christ has given us, has sent to us the Holy Spirit that he would guide us until the moment we see Jesus face to face at the end. The prologue tells us not only of who Jesus is, but why that matters to us. The result of the incarnation of Jesus, the gracious, the glorious coming of the revelation of the Son of God, Logos in the flesh, is that you and I, though we were once enemies of God, though we were diseased with sin, though we were once dead in our trespasses, through faith, through God's grace, that we can be counted as real children of God. Not only at the end of our life, but right now as we live here on earth, that you can be counted as a child of God. This is the gospel of John, the gospel of Jesus Christ shared in the book of John. Brothers and sisters, I really, really pray that we would get invested and involved in this 
sermon series in this book because this book has so much in store for us. John has really, really taken really close, detailed measures to write in these specific words so that you and I would follow Jesus and that we would believe in his gospel. Let's pray.